<laughs> like I said, a lot of it was text. He wasn't subtle about some of this stuff, so... Well, I'm, I, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about it, because I didn't think too much about that as a potential message. But yeah, so we will be discussing the 1982 movie Poltergeist, directed by Toby Hooper, and already we've reached a point of controversy. Why? The movie was co-directed by Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg. And while Steven Spielberg is credited as a producer, a lot of people on set say that he had a lot more creative input than Toby. And in fact, they clashed a lot about certain decisions and, you know, the composition of scenes and things like that. Okay. Uh, So that's actually kind of interesting. Since I know a lot about Steven Spielberg, I know nothing about Toby Hooper. Who is this guy? Like, what else did he do? Most famously, he did the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So, and the second uh, one. And the second one, which very different movies, uh, but that's a whole other discussion. Uh, yeah, I also That definitely brings a lot to the table that Steven Spielberg doesn't. Yeah, I, and I also watched The Mangler the other day, which is a Toby Hooper movie. Um, which, The Mangler to me feels a lot more like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Uh, it's, it's got the big set pieces... In both movies, there's like a cop that's kind of a grizzled expert. So he definitely has his own style, and I I, I pick up on some of that in Poltergeist. Uh, I pick up a lot on the Spielberg elements, which I'll bring up as we go through the movie. I was just going to say, the opening scene with the dog introducing the family, that was pure Spielberg right there. Yeah. Like, you get a couple seconds of, like, the dog just wandering around each individual bed, and you get, like, a nice little, like, personality clip of each of the sleeping family members, and the house layout itself as you follow the dog. Or, like, that was pure Spielberg. And I loved how the dog, as but, he goes to the different family members, he eats something. He, he eats, like, the chips that are on the girl's bed, uh, and he eats, like, some of the food that was on, like, a plate next to the chair that the guy was sitting in. Yeah, I felt a lot of a lot of Spielberg in the dialogue. It seemed really humorous in the way that he does it. Yeah, I mean, like, even the little remote control war they had going on between neighbors, that felt very Spielberg. Oh, I was just thinking that, yeah. Very right. much. The one thing that, to me, is uh, the, the first thing I noticed about Spielberg is he likes to have these scenes where everybody's talking at once. And somehow he manages to write it so it all makes sense. Like, everyone's having their own little conversations in the scene. There's that going on with all the people watching football during the the remote control war. And then in the breakfast scene, you've got the kids talking to each other. You've got the mom trying to ask questions. you got the dad on the phone and you got the guy on the TV talking. Yeah, it's like they, they become gestalt characters. Like, those football guys, they were a single character, right? (laughs) <laughs> i don't know just like a chorus like a greek chorus <laughs> yeah i do think the one guy that came in with the beer is uh particularly dumb uh why would you do that why would you not ditch the can that's spraying everywhere uh, no no but that's the point like it was it wasn't so much about the guy it was to illustrate the the fixation on the importance of that football game right that that guy was just, like, panicking through a house because that football game was so damn important. I see. You know? Like, it again, it, it wasn't about the character. It was about the the communication there, you know? The story beat. Uh, okay, so, like... But, yeah, that guy was a fucking idiot. <laughs> uh, I'll go ahead and read the first paragraph of the synopsis, which is just kind of an overview of the setting. In the suburban housing development of Cuesta Verde, California... The homes are modern and comfortable. Steve Freeling is a successful real estate agent who works for a firm headed up by Teague, a developer. Steve lives in one of the Cuesta Verde homes with his wife Diane and their three children, teenage Dana and preteen youngsters Robbie and Carol Ann. Strange events begin to occur when Carol Ann begins sleepwalking and carries on a seemingly one-sided conversation with a TV set that's turned on but has no signal. Soon thereafter, her pet bird dies, and the family conducts a small burial service. Later that night, Caroline awakens again and talks to the television, while a spectral manifestation erupts from the television screen and enters the walls, 
causing a violent tremor that only the Freelings feel. As the family wakes up, Carol Ann mysteriously announces, They're here. So I was going to say, they're in this movie that spends so much of its time sort of fixated on the nature of death and and what happens after you die i think it's interesting that the only character that dies is a bird a bird that i would like to follow up with creates the foreshadow and that after burying the bird they immediately exhume it in their swimming pool the whole scene sets up the theme of like respecting the dead and, and giving things the proper burial if it was just a matter of you know, leaving things where they lie, you wouldn't be in this trouble. But also the uh, the television. Like, it opens up... You mentioned the remote war, but there was also a couple of other months, too. And there was this whole ongoing theme of invisible signals manipulating things. And so, That's true. the beer guy. The beer guy was tripped by an RC car as the kids were, like, moving it around crazily. And that's, like, literally the opening scene. Then from there you go right into the remote control war where you have the next door neighbor is interfering with their signals. Right. And right. there's all these other instances of like signal interference. Right. The poltergeist shows up the, the, the national anthem scene, right. Where the national anthem is played at the end of the broadcast day. So at that point, the channel is not receiving any standard signals like clean, United States broadcast signals, which gives the poltergeist or the entity a window to access the now empty receiver and, you know, open up the door or whatever. I don't, I, I feel like I'm jumping ahead now. A paranormal Sorry. platform. Uh, it, it's just something <coughs> that comes up again and again of the signals and receivers. Right. Even when Tangina walks in, she says, stand back, you're jamming my signals. Right. Not just, like, paranormal signals, but, you know, other things that are interfering. Like, um, the bit at the dining table, like, after the whole uh, thing with the waffles, and the little girl's just staring at the TV in the kitchen with the, uh, you know, on the dead channel, looking for the TV people. And the mom walks up like, no, that'll mess up your brain. And then switches to this, like, ultra-violent war movie, and she's like, that's fine, and walks away. Again, that commentary of, well, there, this TV is a window into your house, and you should be aware of what's entering. True. I, I didn't think of that so much as being about TV as just, like, media in general, because it was a movie, I'm sure, that she was watching. Well, yeah. Um, but most importantly, it's a movie that's coming directly into your house without any filtering, you know? Yeah. When Carol Ann wakes up and stares at the TV screen in the middle of the night, that's right after the the national anthem plays and it just so happens to be 2:37 a.m. The number uh, 237 is a reference to the shining potentially which would had only come out oh. a couple years earlier. The room I think where the uh, old hag is in the bathtub was room 237. Oh, that's cute. Oh, I noticed there was another movie reference in here. Um the kids bedroom like full of movie posters, right? Primarily Star Wars, obviously, because of Steven Spielberg's connection with Lucasfilm. And, oh my god, that family must be rich with the amount of action figures in that room. But also there was an Aliens poster. Did you catch that? Yeah. Uh, like, the kid was worried about the clown and there's a freaking xenomorph over there. Yeah, It well, is a cre creepy clown. I was going to comment about the mother because I, I think that uh, her parenting style is kind of interesting. Uh, she gets real worried once Carol Ann disappears, but in the beginning, she's kind of careless with everyone. There's the thing with the Alien poster. Like, kids that young probably shouldn't be watching Alien, uh, but maybe they just right. think the poster looks cool. But, I doubt that. It's kind of a boring poster without context. It's just an egg. Yeah. Oh, it's an egg with, like, green slime around it and shit. Regardless, I mean, you could fill that space with Han Solo or something. True. Um, and like, then there's, as a kid without context. Sorry, go ahead. As we get into the breakfast scene that you were talking about, uh, there's a shot where the daughter walks out the door and gets like catcalled by these construction workers, and the mom just sits oh, back know. and watches it and doesn't say well, anything. I mean, she was no, no, she was grinning because she was appreciating her daughter flipping the dudes off. Right, which is 
you know, perfectly fine to be proud of, of your uh, daughter for knowing how to handle that situation. But, uh, you know, she still maybe should have said something like, hey, you fucking pervs. Um, oh, no doubt. But I think that might have just been like one of those signs of the times things like, you know, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. Oh, well, it's a I, test to see if she can handle herself in the real world. Yeah, it's a sign of the times and it's also a character building. It shows that, you know, these are kind of carefree, fun-loving characters that maybe don't take things as seriously as they should. Um, oh my god. Right? Those guys were assholes. And then later when yeah. when stuff starts happening, she fully uses Carol Ann for fucking science experiments, having no idea what effect it would have on her. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, there is a recurring theme of apathy in the film. Like, uh, when the mother discovers Tweety Bird, the dead bird, she said, Oh, Tweety, oh, why couldn't you wait until, like, a school day so I could just flush you without the kid being here? Which, yeah. sure enough, she gets caught. <laughs> right. That, that that definitely goes back to the, the overarching themes of the movie, too. But just like, ah, they're just people, whatever. Don't even worry about it. So once uh, once the father gets home and he sees, uh, we didn't really talk about the, the, the setup of it, of the, the chairs getting stacked on top of each other. Um, no, not at all. That, that's a, a classic scene. Uh, that was done very quickly. They had those chairs like all glued together and shit. And they, there's a, a pan, the camera moves to the, to the right or something. And in the seven seconds that the camera's moving, the crew just like went and sh- sh- you know threw that thing on there and ran away. They NASCAR'd it. It's all done in one quick shot. Yeah. Oh, see, I assumed that it was just they had that hung up with uh, like strings from the like fish wire or something because those are some precarious ass chairs. Yeah. Well, they did have uh, also wires underneath some of the things, like when the when the things are moving ac- across the counter. And when the uh, chair is sliding across the floor, they actually were like underneath the floorboards with wires pulling it. Uh, so anyway, wow, the that's... dad comes home and they the mom shows him what's going on with the chairs moving around and stuff. And he takes it a lot more seriously. Uh, he's a little bit more afraid and he says, nobody's going in the kitchen until I know what's happening. Which, again, that's American as shit. <laughs> like the... Uh, this is my house. I have a, I have a need to try and take control of this situation, manifest destiny, etc. Yeah. Um. But I, at the same time, he kind of never never had a chance, you know. So, having seen what is happening now, they go over to their neighbors to ask if they had been experiencing anything. And this is that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. The uh, the neighbor is so delightfully douchey. Just contradicting oh, know, right? everything they say, giving him weird looks, and the way they cut away on his face after they tell him that you know shit's been moving around on its own. Uh, one of the funniest moments in the whole movie. That specific scene with the mosquitoes, right? What was the deal with the mosquitoes? Was that just was that supposed to re- represent something, or was it like part of the haunting, or just them being nervous, or what? Like I feel like I was missing something there. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I do think they were real mosquitoes and they were really biting them. Uh, I don't think they yeah. were just like feeling itchy out of nowhere. But I thought it was funny how the the uh, neighbor claimed that he'd never been bitten by a mosquito. Because, I mean, surely that's a lie. Right. Uh, I, I don't his, know. Son, I just... his son pulls a Bobby Hill. I don't know, Dad. <laughs> there was uh, something else that happened before that. The bit where the kids are scared of the old tree outside. Uh... So the father, you know, takes the little girl aside and, you know, tells her the story about the wise old tree that he chose to protect the family. I'm wondering if there was something else going on with that tree. Like, obviously, the father, either he was just making up a story for his kid or he did actually sense a presence there. There's no way of telling. But if the tree itself, like, was a conduit of the spirits or if it actually was a protectorate tree and what happens later is uh, the tree trying to protect the family. You know, bringing the children into its grasp away from the malevolent entity that's inside the house. Hmm. I don't know. Just to continue. I, I hadn't Something thought about it that about. way. Um, I will say about the tree that it was based on 
a real experience of Steven Spielberg growing up. He had a tree outside of his window that would knock on his window every time it would storm, and uh, he fucking hated it. So he brought that to life <laughs> in the film. It um, worked. What I read is that the tree outside the window is identical to the tree in the graveyard later on when they're talking out there on, on the hill, which is supposed to be a, a clue that the uh, house is built on burial ground. Oh, yeah, definitely. I got that. I, I didn't notice that they were the same tree, but I, I can see that. But that, that definitely kind of leads to whether or not the tree is there to keep the spirits in or to project the spirits out. But either way, it's, you know, trees have always been a conduit, just mythologically. I also wonder if the visual of the tree, and specifically there's a shot where it gets sucked up into the tornado uh, or whatever's going on, the vortex. And Right. That it, was the other thought that was like, the tree being removed allowed the spirit to gain a stronger hold on the house. Which is why I started thinking about it actually being a protector entity. I was just wondering if that shot was inspired by Evil Dead, because again, that movie only came out like a year earlier, but it was finished at like a couple of years before that. And it may have been like, mm -hmm. you know, they may have seen it at a festival or something. Yeah, floating uh, around Hollywood. Because it definitely is a very uh, familiar visual. <laughs> right? No, I actually have in my notes here, who would win in a fight? Wise Old Tree or Evil Dead Tree? <laughs> Uh, during a terrible thunderstorm, a gnarled tree outside the kid's bedroom window suddenly comes to life and grabs Robbie, Carol Ann's brother, through a window. However, this is merely mm. a distraction used by the ghosts to get Carol Ann's parents to leave her alone. Using a force like a wind tunnel, they take Carol Ann through her bedroom closet into their dimension. Steve rescues Robbie and the family believes that a tornado caused the trouble until they realize that they can't find Carol Ann. They search the entire house, including the pit for the new swimming pool, until Robbie hears Carol Ann calling for her mother eerily through the TV. I don't think it was a distraction. I think it was a coincidence. Well, not a coincidence, but the tree, realizing something's up, reaches out to, to protect the boy, but is thwarted by the more powerful, angry spirits. I can see it. Um, the shot where Carol Ann gets sucked up through the portal... She's hanging onto her headboard, there's wind blowing in her face, there's fucking toys in the air everywhere behind her. That was the only scene that supposedly actually scared the actress Heather O'Rourke during filming. Um, oh, great, great effects just throughout this movie. But that's when I first started noticing, like, wow, okay, I should be paying attention to this. Like, it was already a very well shot film, but... Okay, something else that I noticed is starting with this scene, the director of photography, I don't know who it was, Steven Spielberg or Toby Hooper. So Toby Hooper. Yeah. They put a fisheye on it. Like there's a fisheye lens, a very subtle fisheye lens on the camera. Whenever, when they're like going through the house, trying to call for the girl, which just gives it a really disorientating, like a subtle disorientation. Like the room is off balance. It is outside you know, the normal four dimensions that we are used to. Yeah. Um, which just really struck me. I mean, probably because I was watching it in the middle of the night, but like I felt unbalanced because of that. The fish and that I comes up a little bit later. Reminds me yeah. of Evil Dead. Oh, I know, right? Can I say that I liked the apparitions, the way they portrayed them at first with the glowing spheres and then later on as yes. it got more intense? <laughs> yeah, their special effects got more intricate. Yes, definitely. I will say that some of the effects were better than others. Uh, the, definitely some of the lightning looked kind of corny. It was very, like... And it was, like, the early 80s, so if it was... Uh, it kind must of have been all the practical, CG, yeah. Uh, like, that was, a, that was a guy with a lighting rig and a big sheet of aluminum foil. Uh, it was effective, though, for what it was. Absolutely. And, uh, oh, my and God. I, that... The counting the lightning, that was also just pure Steven Spielberg right there. Yeah, he tells them that the way you can tell if a storm is getting farther or closer is by counting between the lightning strikes. Which is you know, something that I'd never impressive. heard. Oh, really? Oh, I I don't know. I was a big old science nerd when I was a kid. But also, contrasting with the fact that they're totally smoking it up in the other room. So he is blazed off his mind while he's saying that to his kids. Which is right. even more impressive. <laughs> 
we did kind of skip over that part too. There, there is a lot of references to them being stoned early in the movie. I think that plays a major role in the scene with the uh, the neighbor. You know, the way they're laughing about his name definitely lends itself to the idea that they're, you know, really high. <laughs> Who the hell is their dealer, though? Is my question. Yeah, whatever it's they're like, smoking, it must be good. I Doing guess dives off I've... their bed and shit. <laughs> But it's like this weird ass suburb housing complex in the middle of nowhere, white America. Like, maybe they've just got like a private grow somewhere. Which, I mean, considering how tainted it must be, that ground would only increase the high. Also, maybe the first Stephen King movie. Stephen King, Jesus Christ. Maybe the first Steven Spielberg movie I've seen that actually had real references to marijuana and shit. Like,. Maybe that was the the Hooper el- the Hooper influence. I don't know. It feels like it shouldn't have been p- rated PG. Well, that's kind of a, a little bit of a story of its own. Uh, it was originally going to be rated R, and in the UK, it was going to be rated X. Um, and then, like, th- I think the same year, they introduced the 15 rating in UK. Uh, I do know that they had to like kind of argue to get a PG rating that they eventually got. Because they're like, yeah, you know, there's violence, but nobody dies, and it's all... It's a family you know, film. It is a family, a family film. You know, even though there is references to weed and underage sex and, uh, you know, oh my violence God, and yeah. death. That was interesting. With the teenage, like the teenage daughter be like, oh, yeah, I know that place. The Holiday like, Inn. Oh, yeah, right? Like, I didn't catch that at first. Then later I was like, wait a second. <laughs> Well, I guess behind the scenes, everyone was kind of laughing at the fact that the actress that was playing her was like 25 or something like that. So there is a, a lot of... I, I feel like the behind the scenes story of Poltergeist is almost more interesting than the movie itself. Well, we can get into that. I mean, we've seen the movie, but what's going on with you behind the scenes? Well, uh, there is what is known as the Poltergeist curse that has plagued the entire franchise. The same year, I believe, I I have it in my notes, um, but very shortly after the release of the film, uh, Dominique Dunn, who played the teenage daughter Dana, was strangled by her boyfriend on the night before Halloween. She never woke up, and she died five days later at the age of 22. Heather O'Rourke died about six years later in 1988 from intestinal stenosis, which normally develops very slowly over your life, but in this case developed very suddenly. Um, there's a, uh, a line in Poltergeist 2 where Carol Ann says, I don't want to grow up much, and it's a bit dark. I thought to myself, you're in luck, kid. Her nickname, too, the Poltergeist Girl? Yeah. <laughs> very spooky. There were other various strange occurrences that happened with the film as well, but we'll uh, perhaps talk about those later. Supposedly, they're buried in the same cemetery. But uh, getting back to the story of the of the movie itself. I like um, how visually Steve's life falls apart. He just really goes to shit. Oh, I know. He's like, they've got like eyeliner on him just to indicate just the bags under his eyes. And yeah, he's checked out like that man has just checked the fuck out. Yeah. Yeah. This is my life now. Hulk action figure flying around the room and. You know, I I joke about, uh, you know, the mom being perhaps not the best parent and stuff like that. But I love these characters. They feel so real and so lifelike. And you can feel that they they are a family and they love each other, you know? Again, it felt very Steven Spielberg like that. Like, just all the family interactions. Like, and like the scene, well, I guess all the real dialogue heavy scenes. Like, later he's talking to his boss and he's like, yeah, no, we, we have the flu. That's it. The flu. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I liked especially the part then where his boss says, I didn't see your daughter. And Steve says, she's around. Uh, that's uh, really that's the best way you can describe answer. it. Oh, right? But also just, like, the despair, Right? Like, just that awkward despair of it all. Like, no, no, she's she's around. 
A traumatized Steve meets with a small group of parapsychologists from UC Irvine, stating that we just want you to find our little girl. Dr. Lesh, Ryan, and Marty are awestruck by the manifestations they witness. With the parapsychologists present, Steve shows them things they've never seen before. He opens the door to the children's room to reveal toys and other objects flying around by themselves and disembodied laughing voices reverberating throughout the room. Previously, Ryan described a matchbox car taking seven hours to move seven feet, calling it fantastic. Of course, this would never right. register on the naked eye. After they see the <laughs> Freeling's house, they are all humbled. Uh, I do find it's it, it's funny how uh, these supposed paranormal sightings in real life are always uh, not very impressive. It's, it's always something like, yeah, it moved over the course of seven hours. Like, well, maybe it's just gravity electromagnetic frequencies right. something like that you know earth tremors this was an interesting scene too like just again this whole sequence with the, that the initial meeting with the parapsychologists incredibly well thought out like there was a lot going on um because you get that it's almost like a it was comedic like this was just this very comedic moment in what gets to be a very dark film after some dark moments in the film so it's kind of the uh the the winding up for the next pitch i I forget the movie term but like you get that you lay the setting with the no this car it's we've seen amazing things and then punchline open the door and then you get you know set up the next gag where they're you know dealing with their initial revelations while like the family is just so over it at this point like shit's moving around and they're barely even noticing it and whereas the parapsychologists are just pissing their pants uh Which... there's that hilarious moment where she says oh, it's not easy to tell if your house is haunted and then the coffee pot moves right in front of her right right it, it's just there's just a lot of good punchline elements in this and also the the straight man the, a lot of good like straight man acting now, this came out two years before Ghostbusters, so I wonder if there was any, uh, you know, if Ghostbusters was inspired by Poltergeist. Yes. More on that later. Again, this is a haunted house movie, right? But they do a lot to make it not a haunted house movie, while still kind of taking the established, you know, Vincent Price dilapidated manner and then turning it on its head, right? Like, right. it's not an ancient 300-year-old Victorian mansion. It's a modern housing complex, which brings the threat directly into the regular movie audience's living room, quite literally. But in addition to that, it's not steeped in folklore. It's not – well, it is, but it's not like an ancient curse, pirate curse and, like, gold stained with blood that's tainted the ground. It's – it's science. There are scientists here investigating the very real science of parapsychology. It's not folklore, right? And it, it, it does this really nice grounding. Well, it makes it harder to discount, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And it, the movie is very interesting for that. So it, it just does a really interesting job of inverting all of those very traditional themes in a modern way that the makes those rather tired and outdated themes relevant to modern audiences. The writers said know. that they said it in a modern uh, high-end suburb because they wanted to uh, sort of explore a space that people felt safe to give them that, you know, full. It, it's like a false yeah. sense of security. No, oh, they did an excellent job. And like I said, just all of the themes of this movie are about that, that false sense of security. Like the television set with the ultraviolet war movies, there's a lot of it in there. Rubbing you the wrong way and making you think a little harder about the world you live in. Also, something else about this sequence is I thought it was really interesting where she's talking to her daughter, right? With the parapsychologist witnessing it. And it almost became this sort of like 1920s radio play, you know? Like you could see the daughter because of the impressions the you know the acting of the one the one um the mother was making you see the daughter you know and i just thought that was really interesting it kind of a they turned the movie into a radio play 
Uh, uh, there is a lot of excellent use of audio. The music by Jerry Goldsmith is fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm buying that soundtrack. I, that was that was my first note. I was like, is this John Williams? No, it's not. Who is this guy? <laughs> now, speaking of the soundtrack, there is an additional story about the death of per, the woman who played Dana. Um, apparently, okay. her neighbor heard the scuffle going on. And uh, he was kind of used to it at that point because they had been in an abusive relationship and uh, it wasn't anything new. And he put on the poltergeist theme, uh, you know, the, the soundtrack to drown out the noise of them fighting. But of course, the noise kept getting louder and more violent and he eventually called the cops. And I guess the the cops or the, you know, whoever uh, he spoke to on the phone when he, when he called them uh, was like, if you were any kind of man, you'd go out there and stop it. But, uh, which by the way, fuck you if you would say something like that. Uh, no shit, what, what a right? horrible, toxic thing for a, a fucking public servant to say, especially. Um, <laughs> go put yourself in danger, or you're not a man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right? Also, do our jobs. But yeah, uh, and of course, unfortunately, that it didn't turn out so well. <laughs> um, no, sounds like not. But yeah, it does have a fantastic soundtrack, and especially, I think it's interesting, uh, there's a sting that they use. It's like a violin or a harp sound, which uh, mm -hmm. was reused for the movie Insidious, which I always refer to as a bad Poltergeist remake. Which, I, you know... I've never seen Insidious. It's a bad Poltergeist remake. <laughs> it, it's no, it Poltergeist is. without any of the fun or charm, really, but... And uh, naked Darth Maul. And naked Darth Maul. <laughs> All right, uh, interesting. I was getting a lot of big ring energy from this too, but I actually like the ring, so I don't know. But yeah. they, they shared a lot of the same themes, I thought. The group witnesses several paranormal episodes where they hear Carol Ann talking to Diane through the TV, see spirits, and hear the pounding of footsteps of some terrible force, which subsequently injures Marty. Marty also yeah, suffers a terrifying hallucination where he seems to tear off his own face. The parapsychologists leave with the exception of Ryan, admitting they need more help. Shaken and overwhelmed, Dana leaves to stay with friends. The Freelings also send Robbie to his grandmother's house for his safety. Uh, so because the actress that played Dana was murdered, uh, they wrote her out of the second movie. They sent her to go to college in the story. But Logical. I wouldn't want to go back to that house. Like, and... just in world. Yeah, I... She was traumatized as fuck. <laughs> she did seem like she was taking it the hardest. You see uh, shots of her kind of crying and grabbing at her head and stuff. and Yeah, just she... rapid denial of what is in front of her. It's kind of funny, though. When I watched the second movie, I didn't even realize that she was gone. I didn't, you know, I didn't miss her, I guess. But is it worth watching? I might, might follow up with that myself. Yeah, I think Poltergeist 2 is a, a pretty good movie. I, it's weird it's less of a horror movie than the first one um okay. although it is it is it does have the very creepy villain reverend kane uh who is this old okay. man named julian beck who has just the creepiest old man smile that you'll ever see this sequence specifically the hallucination sequence it felt really out of place with the the manifestations up to that point <laughs> It felt like part of a different movie, like a Freddy Krueger movie or something, you know? It did have that vibe, and I think part of it is just the horrible fucking visual. Like, uh, the the, the uh, really corny the pulsating dummy. Meat. Yeah, well, not just that, but up until that point, like, the, the manifestations have all been relatively physical and electrical, right? They hadn't really shown any ability or intention of affecting anyone's mind. At least not though it's shown to the viewer, right? So it just really came out of nowhere, I thought. Like, I can see the the slab of steak that someone just, like, left out on the counter, right? That's weird in itself. Um, but if it was a physical piece of meat, I can see that as the spirit's electrical energy manipulating the meat and pushing it around and shit. Which, weird, but okay, I'll take it. But then... It goes to the the full visual and physical hallucination sequence in front of the mirror. And I'm just like, how and why? You know, it, it just really felt out of place as part of a different movie that 
I mean, it, it could have been very easily edited out if it was on TV, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, would have lost anything for it. It is the goriest moment in the movie, I think. Uh, it definitely probably would have helped shake that R rating that they were worried about. Right? It just so weird and again out of out of place for the the skill set of the spirits up to that point you yeah know? that to me though is the worst visual in the movie like in terms of quality like that was the that took oh, me out of yeah. it a little bit um it fun took me fact out just for all of the reasons but go ahead the hands that were pulling at the head the, that were pulling off the skin those are steven spielberg's hands and the prop master said he wanted Steven Spielberg to do it himself because he didn't want Spielberg the next day to go like, who's this dumb motherfucker pulling away the flesh? Like, he fucked up the whole shot. That makes sense. I would probably do the same thing if I was... The... Yeah. But that also means that Steven Spielberg definitely had a point for having that scene in there. And I would love to know what it was. <laughs> The part with the meat uh, was one of the scenes that Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper clashed on, apparently... Toby Hooper saw it as being uh, the, the the transformation of the meat as it kind of like pulls itself inside bubbled. out. It bubbled up. Yeah. And I think in the script it, it said something like it was cancerous. And so he had the props guys make this like this piece of meat that had like a bunch of tumors in it and it was growing and expanding. And like when, when Spielberg saw the prop they made, he was like, uh, let's keep it simple, guys. They're not going to know it's meat if we fuck it up this much. And Toby Hooper was kind of mad. Worked. That... Yeah. I, I like the, the way it looks uh, in the final product, but I think they had like a different prop all made up. And then Steven Spielberg just yeah. kind of came up and vetoed it. Um, I honestly would have rather seen a giant tumorous piece of meat because I think it felt it would feel more in theme with the 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 entity's abilities than a weird skull hallucination. Well, I think that's kind of the point of it is that it's building, it's showing you that the ghosts have many powers. They can do a variety of different things, including make you hallucinate. Okay. A lot of those parts did also, look fleshy. That's true. A lot of ectoplasm and shit. Later that day, Steve has a conversation with his boss Teague about a new housing project going up. They talk about how Steve's company has built over cemeteries in the past, even where the Freelings live now. Whenever the company needed to land uh, to build or expand housing communities, they'd move the cemeteries, coffins, headstones, and all. Teague shows Steve a new housing development the company is building not far from where the Freelings live. As the two walk by the hillside cemetery, Teague tells Steve that he can have a new house right in that spot with a large bay window overlooking the valley. Steve remarks that same the tree. house... Same tree. Uh, yeah. Steve remarks that the house can't be simply built over a cemetery. Teague tells Steve that the company has moved whole cemeteries before. The coffins were dug up and moved along with their headstones to new locations nearby. Teague then reveals that much of Cuesta Verde was built on the location of one of these relocated cemeteries. Steve seems quite astonished at the news, stating that that's sacrilegious. Teague, the manager or the, the boss of uh, Steve, who's speaking to him at the cemetery, uh, the actor that played him, James Karen, was a spokesperson mm -hmm. for a branch of supermarkets called Pathmark. Uh, after this movie came out, people called him and said, I'm not fucking shopping at Pathmark because you were an asshole to the Freelings in Poltergeist. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. That's well done. That's that's the sign of a well-acted scene that's completely fucked you over for the rest of your career. Damn, they so... really tracked him down. <laughs> right? Ah, just can you imagine if there was an internet back then? Oh, no. I've got a, a string of fun facts for you now that you mentioned the internet. Um, the internet is quite unhappy with one Drew Barrymore right now because she has started a new talk show while the WGA and uh, the Actors Guild are on strike. Drew Barrymore auditioned for the role of Carol Ann, but Steven Spielberg wanted someone more angelic. So instead, he put Drew Barrymore in his other movie he was working on, E.T., E.T. Uh... and Poltergeist were very much in competition for a while. They only came out a week apart. Interesting. And 
Spielberg was working on both at the same time. And it was because there were delays on E.T. that he was always on the set of Poltergeist because he had you know nothing better to do because he was waiting for shit. Um, right, makes sense. I think it's probably a better movie for it. I mean, the the whole thing reeks of someone intensely focused on the production, you know? Like, every T crossed, every I dotted. Did we get to the scene we, with the, the lights in the house? That was that was the previous scene, right? With the the lights coming down the stairway in front of the, the paranormal researchers? With the spheres and then the glowing thing wrapped in, like, a shawl or something? Right! It looked like a, a biblical seraph. You you brought up him wanting angels in the movie. He got his angels. Absolutely. Like, you know, the sixth wing face of a lion. Speaking of lions, um, <laughs> there's a roaring ghost that's actually much later in the movie, but uh, right. not the not the head that comes out of the closet, but the other one that apparates. That's like a big chicken looking monster with like really thin limbs. The roar that that ghost makes is now the roar that's used for the MGM Lion logo. Ha! We are nailing these segues. Also, excellent. I will think of that now every time I watch an MGM movie starring James Bond. (laughs) He's part of the Poltergeist universe. So, talking to the boss. We're we're, seg- we're we're scooching over what's actually like a really interesting scene because again it's just that you know the 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 themes of the movie are text at that point you know it's pretty much laying out what it's doing all in that conversation which I found really interesting in how natural it felt for doing that much work you know like that was the punchline for the spooky story <laughs> they've been dead twenty years. But at the same time, you still had, like, what, 40 minutes left? It, this this movie just felt like a series of uh, one-two punches stacked up and nested together like Russian dolls, which, really interesting, well done. It did flow very well, although I will say that it had, like, a, a couple of false starts and then it had a false ending. Uh, like, I thought the movie was about over and when there was uh, 20 minutes left on the clock. Oh, yeah. but that's my point. Like they only treated the symptoms they didn't right, which again is repeated you know a decade or so later in the ring, like same deal <laughs> you let her out, you weren't supposed to let her out, uh but that that's my point, it's like like set up punchline, set up punchline, set up punchline that that false start or that false setting is just another one of those, which I felt was really well done. Uh, so I was talking about the uh, WGA strike that's happening now. Um, the WGA went on strike during production of Poltergeist, and the writers, Mark Victor and Michael Grace, uh, were ordered to picket their own movie that they were working on. So they were outside holding up the signs, chanting and shit, and then somebody came out from the studio and was like, Psst, we'll sneak you in the back. And they came in and worked for like three hours. Maybe they didn't work. Maybe they just oversaw shit. But uh, th- that was kind of funny. They were being jerked in between their, their work and their uh, strike that they had to do. Interesting. Yeah, I, I will say that, um, you know, probably don't do that. Probably if, if you're striking, commit to it fully. Um, right. But this movie has a, a bit of a reputation at this point for not respecting things, right? You don't respect the 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 fucking dead bodies. The dead. Uh, you don't respect the dead. You don't respect all the potential hazards and signals coming into your house without your awareness. <laughs> don't respect, you don't respect what your kids are doing. Right. Which we haven't actually mentioned this yet, uh, but the the dead bodies that were used in this movie were real dead bodies, which is antithetical to the whole theme of the movie. Oh, it's cheaper that Why? way. That's what I've heard, that what? dead bodies are cheaper. Like, real, and, real bodies oh, are cheaper than fake ones. look what happened. You yeah. get a fucking curse. <laughs> How is there not a movie made about this movie? Uh, they did like, do an episode so, of E! True Hollywood Story about it called The Curse of the Poltergeist. Yeah, that makes sense. There's probably, like, plenty of podcasts just directed, like, specifically about this mummy's curse that they've created. A movie about a mummy's curse, and they're like, oh, fuck it, let's just use real bodies. 
they're just dead people, and then all of a sudden, all of your cast and crew are cursed. How did this happen? Oh, you built the graveyard movie about building houses on a graveyard. On a graveyard! Oh. All right. Um, Do you think that was a Toby Hooper or a Steven Spielberg move? <laughs> the, that's a good question. Probably neither, but uh, maybe... <laughs> Uh, it know. was studio interference. <laughs> it could be. Like I the mean, prop they... guy just took a fiver from somebody and pocketed the rest. <laughs> they did have a budget to meet, and uh, I think they had trouble with that because that's another part of the curse. The entire process of filming this movie was fucking miserable. Apparently, it was hot. Everyone was sweaty. Um, there were like the neighbors were pissed off because the the house is a real house in a real neighborhood in California. So apparently built on a real graveyard. Yeah, the neighbors were not happy about all the random explosions and and noises and uh you know big blaring lights in the front lawn. There were a lot of issues. Yeah, I think at one point they had the whole neighborhood going up, didn't they? Well, there was that scene later on where like the house gets sucked into itself after like blaring lights, but I honestly thought a lot of that was done in post, but it can't have all been. Just had real lightsaber, industrial lights, and magic energy. Uh, when the parapsychologists return, they bring a spiritual medium, Tangina Behrens, a tiny woman who uses her psychic sensitivity to ascertain facts about the disturbances. Tangina tells them that Caroline is alive and in this house. According to Tangina, the spirits haunting the home have left this life but have not gone into the spectral light. They are stuck in between dimensions, watching their loved ones grow up but feeling alone, causing them to feel lonely and even angry. Carol Ann was born in the house and has the strongest connection to it. At only five years old, she gives off her own life force that is as bright as the light. It distracts and confuses the spirits who think Carol Ann is their salvation, hence they have taken her. However, Tangina also warns that a malevolent spirit also exists in the next dimension. It likes that the spirits are confused and lost and uses Caroline as a distraction so they cannot move on. Tangina says it lies to her and tells her things only a child can understand. To her, it simply is another child. To us, it is the beast. I don't know. I just felt there was way too much tell and not enough show in this whole sequence. You know, just like... It is very exposition heavy, for sure. I like how they immediately validated her powers by having her know what they were saying. Right. Like, that was the most interesting about thing about this scene was just the, the dad being just a complete douchebag and just her being above it, quite literally, up on top of the stairs, but also from a high ground because, they're like, I heard you. You're just being a fuckhead. Uh, Steve says something about w- uh, which side of the rainbow are we working today. Which uh, might be a reference to the Munchkins and might be a joke about Tangina's height. Oh, yeah, no, nah, he was a tool, and uh, that's what a tool would say. So that's what he said. I felt like uh, similar to the uh, similar to his boss. Like this was another role. Like this actress got super typecast into because of this movie, right? Like, didn't she show up in American Horror Story too? Like, essentially in the same role. Uh, I don't know. I, I only watched a little bit of that show, but I do know that she's in Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Um, right. I'm not, I, I haven't followed up on her whole career, but I'm sure she did get typecast a lot because of this. Uh, she is a very spiritual person in real life, or was, she's dead now. She had a vision that her dog came to her and said goodbye and then she woke up crying, and then a few hours later, her mom called and said, hey, dog died. So she she does claim to have a, a little bit of psychic power herself. But apparently people would like go up to her on the street and be like, hey, can you look at my house? And she's like, no, sorry, I can't. Apparently people saw this movie, and it made an impression. Absolutely. It was the highest grossing horror film of 1982, and the eighth highest grossing in any genre that year. I believe it. It certainly had everything going for it, up to and including a real curse. Noting that there was more fisheye in this in this room, um, like when they're they're talking to the room, and it's just again that that subtle touch of psychic energy distorting the place, which I, I really appreciated that. Uh, Zelda, Zelda Rubenstein, who played Tangina, auditioned for the role four times. 
before she was finally chosen. Uh, the shadow possession was interesting, though. I don't know if that's a little too far ahead. Like uh, when she backs up against the wall. Yeah, when she backs up against the wall and she starts saying, go into the light, go into the light. The entity was basically depicted as a shadow, kind of like a la Bram Stoker's Dracula. Like literally manipulating the psychic, like fingers in her brain. You know, I thought that was really really? effective. I didn't. Yeah. Because I was thinking like she's very wishy-washy about it. She's like, you know, tell her to go into the light. Tell her not to go into the light. Like she contradicts herself a bunch. Yeah, she's fighting the entity that's trying to possess her. You know, signals going in, signals going out. Interesting. Yeah, that, I'll, that's I'll why I watched and... this movie three times, because there were things that I didn't pick up on even until the, the last viewing. Cool skull, bro, is my next note after that. <laughs> Which, I did feel that was a pretty cool skull, bro. Uh, oh. They realize the entrance to the other dimension is through the children's bedroom closet. Tangina tests the dimensional portal with a few tennis balls that drop through the living room ceiling below the kid's closet. By tying a rope around a live person who can enter and presumably exit the other side, with enough time to grab Carol Ann, they could bring her back. Which, by the way, that was fucking Robbie's plan that he had, except he was like, what if I died? What if you killed me, but you tied a rope around me first? Uh, Oh, no. The, The dad was listening that whole time. Like... While the kid was talking off screen, it was focusing on the dad just taking it all in and be like, (laughs) hmm. Very film noir with like, you know, the great, the shadows of the great on his face. It's like a shot in a thousand movies. Tangina intends to be the one to go into the light, but Diane insists, saying that Carol Ann will only come to her mother. With the rope around her waist, Diane goes into the portal and Tangina coaxes the agonized spirits away from Carol Ann to the real light. While Tangina is in her trance-like state telling the lost spirits to cross over into the light, Steve panics and pulls on the rope, meeting the beast face to face. Diane falls through the living room ceiling, clutching Carol Ann and bearing new streaks of gray hair, presumably from fright, just like uh, the Nancy in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm-hmm. Uh, which this film predates, I guess. So um... Interesting. Because the the shot later in the real climax, but more on that later. Both Diane and Carol Ann are also covered in ectoplasm, uh, which was another part of the issue. The ectoplasm had a bunch of alcohol in it, and it made them really fucking cold. And they had to take they had to do lots of shots, lots of takes of those scenes where they were covered in goo. Uh, after Steve revives both of them in the downstairs bathtub, Tangina pronounces that this house is clean. Uh, this house is clean. This house is clean, man. This house is clean. <laughs> they make sure that the uh, camera is focused on her. The uh, little camcorder they got. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. This house is clean. There was there are so many drops in this movie. Oh, my God. Uh, but, yes, the house is clean. Unfortunately, though the spirits have seemingly moved on, the beast hasn't and wants revenge. On their final night in the house, Steve leaves Diane alone with the children so he can go and talk to Teague, who presumably is trying to get Steve to reconsider leaving. While Robbie and Carol Ann are getting ready for bed, Robbie's clown doll comes to life and pulls him under the bed. Diane, relaxing in the master bedroom, hears her son's screaming voice and tries to investigate, but is pulled against the wall and ceiling by an unseen force. Robbie manages to Again. rip the clown doll to pieces, but a strange, mouth-like portal appears in Carol Ann's closet and attempts to suck the children in. Again, super rad. Uh, well done special effects there. Um, backpedaling a little bit. They were They were packing up to move, right? I was under the impression they were, like, leaving that next morning. Yet, the kids' room seemed largely untouched. Why the hell was the clown still there? I have no idea. That's a good question. Because they did have... They were, you know, they had a moving truck. They were packing shit up. I guess they just didn't get all of it. I guess they had a lot of stuff. They are a wealthy family, it seems. I'm honestly shocked that kid just didn't bury that clown in the backyard somewhere months ago. Like, what is the story with that clown? That that's kind of again that's another one of the one two punches throughout the movie um, because in the intro 
there's that sequence like with the tree the kids like really freaked out about that clown right and then he eventually like builds up the courage to throw a blanket on top of it which great you get the fear victory and then oh god there's a face of chewbacca right over the clown face so the clown is essentially still staring at him punchline right and Um, then later on when they're looking for the girl and they find like the shape in the closet that they think is the girl but it turns out they uncover it it's the clown right because the clown was covered up now it is uncovered it's like a jack-in-the-box right and then later on the clown becomes like goes past being like a childhood like you know monster in the closet fear to being a punchline and then all of a sudden it's a legitimate fear in the last third of the movie right and it it turns out oh god the kids fears were justified this entire time (laughs) he really needs to just take a shotgun to that stupid doll I, I was going to mention the clown doll when we were talking about the uh, bad parenting or whatever. They left this fucking horrifying, creepy clown doll in their kid's bedroom. Uh, right? And I, because they're, like, such goofy stoners, I, I'm thinking, like, they gotta be just laughing at the fact that they're scaring the shit out of their kid, right? I would. But, like, this again, is Again, it also feels like a true story from one of the creators. I have heard that Steven Spielberg was afraid of clowns as a kid. I think there was a line from the um, psychic lady that uh, the entity, the beast, knows what you're afraid of or something. So that could also yeah. tie in that. Very Pennywise that way. So uh, the curse of Poltergeist also comes into play in this scene here. Uh, the actress, Jo Beth Williams, who played the mother... Mm-hmm. The way they shot that scene where she's being pulled up on the ceiling is they had like a big box of a room on like a, a some kind of axis. It was the room was actually rotating around her as opposed to her being dragged up with wires or anything. Um, like Nightmare on Elm Street. But apparently she got like cut and scraped a whole bunch because of the rig. You know everything was kind of n- not safe enough, and uh, she got scratched up. But the more serious thing was happening in the other part of the shot where Robbie's being choked by his clown doll. Uh, Oliver Robbins yeah. actually did get choked by that clown doll. It, it tightened up around his neck and he went, I can't breathe. And Steven Spielberg just thought he was ad-libbing. He's like, that's great. I, fucking, it's method. I love it. <laughs> and method it, acting he, all around. He eventually started to turn purple and then that's when they stopped the scene. <laughs> oh, shit. really good. <laughs> uh, yeah and i hope they kept all of it <laughs> there's an actress shirley mclean who was approached to play diane but she objected to the terrorization of children so she refused the role oh also when the um when the ghost lifts the mother up that's like at least partly a sex thing right because it like lifts her shirt <laughs> Yeah. You know, I was thinking that. Like, was that a vibrator sitting next to her in that scene, too? Like, I was trying to figure out what the fuck that was. <laughs> like, because she just got out of the tub at that point, And, you know, clearly ready for bed. And then she's all packed up, except for that, like, weird-ass-looking phallic object, like, right next to her. Just like, this isn't for kids. Uh, I didn't notice the object in question, <laughs> but I did notice that they made her sexy for the final scene. You know, for the big, Indeed. like... As is tradition. Flapper's good point about it pointing out that the uh, the psychic said that it knows what you fear. Uh, another running theme through the uh, the movie was the pool, right? And earlier on um, during the smokeout, the wife is like really paranoid because apparently she was a sleepwalker as a child. And she's worried that her kids will have inherited that trait. And will wander into the empty pool and drown. And then well, later, that's essentially what happens to her. Yeah, they. Uh, she thinks they've inherited the trait because uh, Carol Ann was waking up in the middle of the night, quote unquote, sleepwalking, talking to ghosts. Right. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah, the swimming pool is a big deal in this movie. Um, when they did the scene where she runs out into the pool and there's like a corpse that pops up out of the water. Uh, um, there's a whole art- graveyard. Yeah. 
So her big fear was electricity, right? And they had a whole bunch of lights set up around the pool and cameras and, you know, lots of electricity. Yeah, just the sleepwalking into the pool. And again, she falls into the pool. Well, no, but I mean, the the actress, Jo Beth Williams. Oh! They wanted her to get into a pool full of water with a bunch of electrical rigging set up around it. And she was not happy with that. And One guy wandering around with a toaster. Yeah, that's the thing. There's like a hundred crew members. Somebody could just like bump into a light and she's fried. So Steven Spielberg got fair. in the pool with her and said, hey, look, if something falls in and you fry, I'm also going to fry. And that's what calmed her down and, and got her to do the scene. That's some pretty solid direction. I, I mean, I guess he had confidence in his crew that nothing was going to happen. Uh, but considering all the other things that went wrong with the movie... <laughs> You know, maybe he's the only one that came out unscathed. Uh, Okay, so we were essentially at the point where the mother was attacked. They did the Nightmare on Elm Street scene, which, okay, I'm sorry, we're doubling back again. But now I'm thinking about Nightmare on Elm Street, and they all, I was expecting them because the woman, the the wife gets into the the tub in the bubble bath. I was expecting a Freddy Krueger moment, not realizing that movie hadn't come out yet. And then instead, I get a different Freddy Krueger moment. Which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Which I don't know. It's. I guess that was just the uh, just in the air in Hollywood at the time. But also, it, it did a nice setup where you know you have you know the woman getting undressed. It's the traditional Hollywood vulnerable woman scene with the monster lurking, the unknown presence. But it turns out it was just all false, you know, a faint because it was really the kid that was in trouble. Whereas the mom had a rather pleasant bath. Leads you expect a thing, doubles back, it's the kid, and then you're like, oh, it's the kid, the mom's fine. But wait, the mom's not fine. So there's a a fairly long shot of uh, everyone trying not to get sucked into the portal. Correct. uh, The the actress that played Caroline didn't want to... Like she, it switches back and forth between her actually being there and there being like a a doll, uh, because all she's really doing is being blown by the wind. Uh, Yeah, it's very effective though, and just like that whole like ectoplasmic mouth that 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 closet door becomes, like that was cool. Very creepy. Yeah. Diane tries to get her son and daughter, but runs into the beast itself in the form of a snarling skeletal demon, and I'm pretty sure that's the shot that became the uh, lion logo. It Mm. blocks Carol Ann and Robbie's door and lunges at her, causing her to fall down the stairs. Diane runs to the backyard to seek help from her next-door neighbors, but slips into the freshly dug swimming pool. We talked about that. A rainstorm Mm. has filled it with rain and mud, and Diane tries to escape. Coffins begin erupting from the earth releasing skeletal corpses into the pool. Her neighbors hear the commotion and arrive to help Diane out of the pool, but they refuse to enter the house with its windows now blazing with ghostly energy. Uh, Diane runs back into the house alone to get Robbie and Carol Ann. She finds Carol Ann and Robbie barely able to fight the energy uh, that tries to suck them into the portal. They dangle from their bed frames, hanging on by only their hands, while their feet sway toward the closet door. Diane manages to pull them to safety, and they run from the house. Okay, so we pretty much... That's all the stuff we just talked about. Yeah. And then they go to the hotel inn. Or the Holiday Inn. Dad wheels the TV out, because he is now very well aware of all the signals that can be coming at his family without his knowledge. And, uh... Credits. Well, before all that, before they go to the hotel, there's this scene where they're trying to get away from the house, and they, they get into the buggy... And uh, uh, the daughter pulls up. <laughs> I thought they were going to ditch boyfriend. the daughter. <laughs> yeah, I, see, that's the thing I was saying. I, I thought they did ditch the daughter until like the last time I watched it, right before we started recording. Oh, uh, same. I'm just like, oh shit, they left her behind. Because she gets in she the shows up in the back seat somehow. She, well, yeah, she, you see her getting in, but it's while Robbie's yelling out, "The house is coming!" So you're not really looking at her. Um, no, and, no. Yeah, I just thought that, it, like, they left her behind and the boyfriend took her or something, but... But there was a whole lot of real energy of, like, do we ditch... Do we save the two the good, the two good kids to <laughs> sacrifice the bad kid? There's the shot where uh, Steve confronts his boss and says, You didn't move the fucking bodies! 
You liar. Oh, that was great. That's honestly the only thing I remember from when I watched this originally. It was just that that line reading. That was great. With like, you did it. Move the bodies. Uh, about the swimming pool and, you know, uh, several houses in the area probably had swimming pools and all of them had basements. So if the average body is buried six feet deep, they should have found those bodies a lot sooner than they did, you know, when building the houses. Well, they they found the parakeet body. That's something, right? <laughs> That's true. The The parakeet body came up in the very early part of the movie. Hmm. Uh, but, I mean, you could argue that they simply put filler on top of it. And because... It, there is no way that that valley was level enough for a housing community, so they had to, like, you know, that was the, the first stage of they bring in, like, a bunch of filler dirt to, you know, even the place out for houses. Yeah. So I can I can kind of see them getting away with it to a degree. But, I mean, why get in the way of a good story, right? Uh, the house is located in Simi Valley, California. Stephen King was yeah. approached to write the screenplay, but he could not reach an agreement with the studio. Eh, I think they're okay. They, they did a good job of imitating him without it. <laughs> um, they, If we're just at the, the, uh, the, the IMDb stage. trivia stage. Okay, so you mentioned Ghostbusters earlier. I would also like to bring up Beetlejuice. And as they are all came out roughly the same period of years, right? And ne neither of these three movies directly contradict each other, right? They all kind of use a very consistent, you know, taking these these folkloric tropes and then giving them a, a modern scientific spin. Is this like, I don't want to say an extended universe, but is this just kind of like a theme of the era, do you think? Like, is this just generally what Hollywood was doing with this period? Where it's, you know, scientifically quantify the evil. See, I, I don't feel there's a whole lot of science going on in Beetlejuice, to be honest. Uh, no, not science, but um, the mundane, like, you know, the, yeah. handbook for the, re the handbook for the recently deceased. It's all uh, middle management. You know, you commit suicide, you're an accountant for the rest of your life. You're a, right. your unlife. Like, it... It, it did do its job to, to make a modern, quantifiable suburban mythology, you know? What happens after we're dead and live in middle America? We don't have to worry about giant god Jesus or Ra or Zeus or whatever. But we do have like, to worry about is... Freddy Krueger. No, right? Freddy Krueger. Like, what is the suburban Valhalla? <laughs> well, it's a waiting room and there's sandworms outside. I don't know. Just, it's interesting that a lot of filmmakers seem to be playing with that that very similar theme of what is the 1980s life after death. Uh, Heather O'Rourke kept the goldfish that she got to replace the bird. I wonder how long it survived. Ooh, I'm just going over my own like notes. 12? Well, if you keep them fed properly, and they're hard to keep alive. <laughs> Like, no, the girl, not the goldfish. Oh, right. That too. Girls are also hard to keep alive. <laughs> uh, the girl was six when the movie was shot, and she was 12 when she died. Yeah, she could probably keep a goldfish that long. Yeah, I would hope so. And also, just the contrast of just watching a very modern movie before watching this movie. Whereas there's so much more big wide long shots that you just don't see much anymore because modern cinema is more tuned towards like the tv in your living room as opposed to a giant wall hmm. so you don't get as many of those like that opening scene where it's just showing the entire housing development and then it's the little car um just you know tracing through it I feel that's also um, very much a Spielberg thing. He likes his oh, uh, very establishing much. shots. Very much. Not just the establishing shot. Oh, the not just Spielberg too. The, like the opening to The Shining for the same reason. Like You are dropped into that world. That world becomes encompassing, which just doesn't have the same effect on a small screen. And just also the way he was kind of um, like laying out some of the shots. Like there's, I didn't mention this earlier, but there's... 
a very strong um, geography inside the house. Like this is particularly apparent in the scene where they're first uh, the parapsychologists have showed up, and you've got the mom staring at the audience talking to her daughter. You've got the dog off in like you know the six o'clock position, staring at where the daughter spirit actually is, and then you have the parapsychologists off in the corner watching the dog who is currently off screen. And it just sort of gives you a big sense of the layout of the house. But if you tried to, like, knock that into a 4-3, like, I can't imagine watching this on, like, USA Network back in the 90s because they would have had to, like, crop the shit out of this movie and have, like, panning shots and you'd lose so much of it. Right. Like, before it even, they'd have to cut out all the stuff like the marijuana and, like, the heavy drinking and violence. But just the way these shots are laid out, you can only do on a big screen, right? Yeah. Which, sign of the times, right? Whereas now everything, you've got the just a panning green screen and I don't know um, that very everything big heads. these days is optimized for, for smaller screens, per se. Like, there's still, so I think, a lot of, you know, directors experimenting with wide shots, but it, it's it true. definitely it's is true. more it's, pronounced. I would say you're correct, but modern cinema is much more of a compromise between the two extremes. Right. Whereas this was definitely an extreme geared towards cinema. And I think that As the a... movement throughout the shots, like the the lively the liveliness of the uh the neighborhood and the house, it makes it feel more realistic, more alive. Oh, very much. And again, like we were talking about the staircase scene, but where, you know, the not only the lights are coming down, and just that that staircase as a set piece, like you it stretches. It quite literally stretches. And then you have that, like, sort of house plant that's stretching, like, curving towards the the staircase to kind of create this off-center frame around the scene. And then you have, like, the incredibly short woman standing at the top of the staircase, literally presiding over the scene and, you know, talking down on this asshole who's, like, doesn't respect her. You just can't get that without a whole lot of real estate. I don't know, just very impressive movie, I gotta say. Uh, this movie was uh, nominated the times. for Best Score and Best Special Effects at the Oscars, but it lost to E.T. in both categories. I would say that it was robbed. Steven Spielberg could complain. Definitely Goldsmith. I mean, that was a fantastic score. That is funny um, that you should mention about television. I think the ghost and the paranormal stuff generally left a... Did they play with the radio at all? I don't... No, but then who listened to the radio in the 80s, right? Like, that was... That's the domain of the car. <laughs> and they didn't really spend much time on the car. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, in the sequel, there is... A, I think even it might be the first scene of the movie where they, they're listening to a baseball game on the radio. And Robbie's like, Dad, can't we get a TV like normal people? And he's like, no, son, we're not getting a fucking TV after what happened. Not like a radio is any better. Yeah, it's still uh, a conduit through which surely spirits can speak. But no shit, um, he definitely developed a bit of a phobia there, as as evidenced by the closing shot of him rolling the TV out. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even say that's a phobia. That's just being aware. That is an awareness that you have learned through trial and tribulation. Uh, Direct TV did a parody ad in two thousand eight. Where uh, I, I think the dad said something like, not cutting cable, now that's something that'll come back to haunt me. Um, <laughs> Heather O'Rourke's family praised the ad for keeping her da- their daughter's memory alive in some form. Aww. I believe it. And I, I mentioned, I keep mentioning The Ring because I feel that's a very direct spiritual successor. Pun, you know, attended after the fact. Where, again, it's that that medium of, well, you have this spirit, at, you know, unrest, and it will latch on to whatever medium it can to make its feelings known. And then again, it also did a lot of playing with televisions for the same reason. It is that direct conduit. And then again, there's that scene of the ring where, well, the American version of the ring, I forget if it was in the original or not, where, you know, she's just looking at the balcony of all the television sets on and all the apartments and... You know, television. 
<laughs> Did you say there was a reference to the Twilight Zone somewhere? Oh yeah, yeah. When they were uh, the parents were baking in the, the original scene, I'm I didn't check. I am fairly certain it's the Twilight Zone though. I didn't write down the name of the movie, but that's a movie that they're watching. Oh, it's a movie. Okay, I thought it was the Twilight Zone. My bad. Yeah, but there is a connection to the Twilight Zone that is uh, very clear once you've watched it. It's there's an episode of the Twilight Zone called Little Girl Lost where a little girl falls under her bed through a hole in dimensions and she falls into another dimension and her parents can hear her but they can't see her. It's a little bit different in the way they go about it. There's not, you know, a bunch of ghosts and demons making things uh difficult, but they they do have a very similar uh plot structure where like they call for help and they don't, you know, the person doesn't believe them and then that that person disappears. Yeah, it's it's a lot more playing with quantum physics than parapsychology. And then in the end, the dad has to go into the portal to the other dimension uh, to get his daughter. But yeah, that's that's definitely uh, a direct inspiration. Oh, well, I'm almost out of notes here. I I do have that the first scene to be filmed was the closet scream where she's looking for Carol Ann. And she opens the closet door and there's just a loud, horrible soul piercing scream and the last thing to be filmed was the mirror scene where the guy rips his face off why they could have just ended it a day earlier i don't know i'm still bitter about that scene apparently (laughs) it just it took me out of it it really did like because i just got all hung up and distracted i'm just like wait a second why is it just because they wanted to get rid of that specific character they could have done it through other means he was already physically attacked like they didn't need to like mentally traumatize him at the same time or they could have like played up the attack more if they wanted some, you know, reason to traumatize this poor intern. Yeah, was the uh, bites on his ribs before or after that? They were before. Which again, maybe that was some way of like a vampiric taint or something. Like it's in his bloodstream now, but I don't know. But as as for it not falling in line with the the other things the ghosts do, I think part of the idea is like. There are multiple ghosts that work here, and they all kind of work differently. They've all got their specialties. Thanks. Yeah, because in the end, when all the <laughs> coffins are popping up, you know, I, I assume that's all the people that are haunting the house. In yeah, addition to like, the beast. Yeah, like you've got your beast running the show, and then you got your bitey guy, and you got your wall crawly guy, and you got your let's stack chairs guy. That's probably a troop. <laughs> Uh, I I would recommend watching the second one. I haven't. Uh, I I'm not sure if I've seen the third one. I think I saw it years ago. Um, I can only imagine it's diminishing returns, though. Y- yeah, and I I don't know what happened on the set of the third film. I know that the, in, the, in the second one there was also a, a moment where Craig T. Nelson, who played the dad, almost suffocated because they have like uh, a a thing coming up out of his throat, like a worm monster that he spits out, and the prosthetic Jesus. they made. Uh, did not work correctly. It, it was all, you know, they, they're like, yeah, we spent hours in the van testing it. It'll go off without hitch. It's completely safe. And then when it actually gets put to use, uh, it nearly chokes the guy. Gross. I wonder how they did that in the ring. Like maybe that was like CGI or something. I don't know. I know. I keep bringing up that movie. That's just impress. It's just embedded in my psyche at this point. There was <laughs> Jurassic Park. I haven't seen the ring in a while. I, I, I definitely see the connection. I mean, it's a ghost story involving TVs as a medium. I mean, it's it's a lot more uh, focused. It's just a single spirit who's just pissed at the world. But I think that's more a matter of, you know, the Japanese ghost story versus the American ghost story and their various cultural baggages. I was just thinking back to a... Um, I think it's Crimson Peak, which is like a Victorian paranormal kind of ghost story where it's more of a sad one than an angry ghost. Yeah, excellent movie. That's also a lot more traditional. Where where you actually do have the crumbling hundred year old manor and the folklore. Like it's it's playing the genre straight. They did have a paranormal advisor on this movie and its sequels, uh, which is interesting. They tried to make everything in that regard as true to life as possible okay how cool was his name 
Yeah, I was going to say, did he show up on our bell? Lloyd Auerbach, I think. Maybe not. Lloyd Auerbach, parapsychologist. Tickets start at 20 bucks. I mean, if it earns some money. Right? How do I get that gig is what I want to know. Like, I could psychologicalize paranormal. Uh, well, they did have, like, I, I guess a, a medium on set that was, like, blessing everyone and trying to... Um... And I think they, they did more of that on, like, the sequel because there were people already at that point that believed in the curse. But... Yeah, reactive right measures. Someone, someone completely failed to earn their paycheck. <laughs> you know what? That could have all been avoided if they didn't use real goddamn bodies. <laughs> like, which was cheaper? The psychic, the psychic or just making paper mache dead people? <laughs> you know we're going to incur bad karma, so we brought a psychic. We're being proactive. And that concludes our discussion of Poltergeist. <laughs> Next time we'll introduce ourselves. Maybe. I was Maybe. Flapper Jane. I'm probably Random Flashbang. There's a distinct possibility I could be Sarkanus. But we doubt it. He hasn't had the papers. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation and we hope you'll subscribe for more creepy content.